you start a company devoted to making products, it's best to have a division dedicated to research and development. And when Nintendo started their venture as a toy company, Nintendo Research and Development was founded, making such toys as the Ultra Hand for the Japanese market. Of course, cut to a few years later and video games were becoming a growing interest, so much so that companies straight up switched priorities to give this new medium a try, and that included Nintendo. So the research and development team, as well as the company itself, decided to switch its gears from toys to this new interactive electronic technology. And they were so devoted, they straight up split the studio in two, making two research and development teams simply named R&D 1 and 2. One would focus on the games themselves, with games like Sheriff and Radar Scope, while two would focus on a pretty popular market before game consoles with exchangeable cartridges became the norm. Pong consoles. In the late 70s, Nintendo would focus on the market of giving you a console with several ways to play Pong with their Color TV game series including Color TV Game 6 and Color TV Game 15. And then a few years later worked on a little device called the Family Computer. Man, someone should really do a series based on that console. Also, there was a third research and development team starting up around this time, mainly making the Punch-Out! arcade games and would take over R&D2's job of the console development in the late 90s. I honestly have no good ideas on how to segue them into the history of Nintendo's development department, so uh, woo! Nintendo R&D 3, everybody! But there was one game that really shook up the future of Nintendo's development departments, and that was the original Donkey Kong for arcades in 1981. With Donkey Kong being Nintendo's first breakthrough game, all eyes were on the game's director, Shigeru Miyamoto, especially after he developed a few more greats for the company. Donkey Kong Jr., Popeye, Mario Brothers, and when the Famicom was finally released, Devil World. Then Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi decided to open up a fourth research and development branch to house the head of his new talent and bring along with him a few other big names like Takashi Tezuka and Koji Kondo to focus more on the console side of things led by a former anime director, Hiroshi Akita. And Miyamoto and his crew thank Yamauchi and Nintendo by making Super Mario Bros. and giving the company millions of dollars and a great impression as a company to look out for. But what about Nintendo R&D 1? The once top dogs were now only Nintendo's number two, and not exactly at the best place when it came to game releases. Their last game in 1985 was Wrecking Crew, which, you know, isn't bad, but it wasn't groundbreaking in any ways. Just kind of a forgettable Loadrunner wannabe. But if the boys over at Nintendo R&D 1 were going to make a lasting impression, they were going to have to pull out all the stops with a groundbreaking IP to help Nintendo's ever-growing empire grow bigger. And some of the standout crew would include people like Hiroji Kiyotake, Yoshio Sakamoto, Hirofumi Matsuoka, Makoto Kano, and Toru Osawa, working in the design area of work. Hirokazu hip Tanaka on music, and at the top of the food chain would be Satoru Okada and Gunpei Yokoi, serving as head director and producer on most of their games. With a nice staff still under the belt, it was time to make the game to keep Nintendo R&D 1 relevant, a game that stood out like no others, a game that shined brightly to gamers with its unique gameplay, I'm talking about Gumshoe. Okay, that was more like a quickie project to hold over the American market, but their next game would certainly hold those same descriptions. I am of course talking about Metroid. In the year 2000, several planets joined together to create the Galactic Federation, a joint effort of peace to help exchange culture and maybe cut back on all the deaths from war, I guess. And it turned out to be pretty successful. As the years pass, populations grow, civilizations expand, and now the planets have a trading system to trade between themselves. And of course, when you got shipments of goods going planet to planet, you'll get pirates. Space pirates. Pirates. 
in space. So the Galactic Federation creates a police force to try and stop them, but of course as cops, they're no good. So GF has to rely on for higher bounty hunters to actually get some results. We jump ahead to the year 20X5, which means 5 to 95 years later, take your pick, and the space pirates make one of their biggest attacks yet. This time on a research spaceship grabbing a hold of a capsule that contains an unknown life form from the planet SR388. This being is currently in suspended animation and exposure to beta rays could reactivate it within hours and multiply greatly. And judging from the fact that civilizations on SR388 have been wiped out, this being classified as a Metroid could do incredible harm in the wrong hands especially the hands of the space pirates. The pirates take the Metroid to their home base on the planet Zebus and begin the process of multiplying the Metroid. But thanks to an investigation by the space police, the pirate's base was discovered. But unfortunately, they are too powerful for the police to take on themselves. So as expected, it's bounty hunter time, as the Galactic Federation sends in Samus Aran. According to the manual, it is a cyborg who is considered one of the greatest bounty hunters in the galaxy, thanks to a spacesuit that can absorb enemy's life force upon feet. And so with mission in hand, Samus enters the base of the space pirates and begins his search for the Metroid. Hopping into Metroid for the first time without any knowledge of the series can result in two things. One is you running to the right, blasting at a bunch of enemies with your energy cannon, collecting health along the way as you travel through the corridors, and you come across a dead end. Well, that's lame. So you travel back the way you came, and you find that to your left is actually the first upgrade, the ability to turn into a ball to travel under small areas called the Morph Ball. Of course, there's a chance you did think to go left and save yourself a lot of time, but basically Metroid teaches us to go left in video games. Metroid's structure as a game has you explore Zebus to your leisure to an extent, because along the way you're going to need upgrades ranging from simple health increases and the ability to shoot missiles by pressing the select button and dealing major damage, but they're mostly used just to open doors, to actual upgrades to Samus' suit like as mentioned before, getting the ability to turn into a ball to reach smaller areas, a bomb ability letting you actually attack in that state and blow up obstacles, and even a long range tier energy cannon which... You know, kind of should have been there from the beginning. The major mission of the game is to find two members of the space pirates located deep within their lairs on the planet and taking them out. After that, the entrance to the final area of the game, Torian, is open and lets you take on the final boss. So to sum it up, Metroid is essentially a space opera platformer version of The Legend of Zelda, with its upgrades and large area to explore that require said upgrades to get further into the game. Which is such a unique idea for a platformer at this time. Even though Mario was the biggest thing in Japanese gaming during the time near Metroid's development and release, there actually hasn't been a huge influx of them hoping for some of that sweet Mario coin. And even then, no other game was trying to be expansive like this. Go beyond just simple get from point A to point B hop and bop style, and give us an adventure platformer. Well, except Atlantis no Nazo, but that game sucks anyways. Metroid got it right. No stupid doorways leading to wherever, a better controlling character, and power-ups galore. And yet, I don't think the first Metroid holds up very well. I'm going to do something a little different compared to my other reviews where I just give the positives out first and then get to the negatives. I'm actually going to cover the negatives first and then get to my positives for reasons I think you'll understand when I get to them. Okay, while Metroid is very commendable for what it was able to do, it sadly has a lot of early game flaws that just makes it a slog to play. There's a lot of these I'm going to call hallway sections of the game, basically a huge stretch of land with multiple doorways for you to enter and explore. Unfortunately, it had to be a vertical design, meaning there's not much to do but go up, up, and up. And if one little accident happens involving these zoomer enemies or these indestructible rippers, you could be going down and have to start all over again. And let me remind you, these hallways are everywhere in this game and they all look alike. There's a good chance you'll forget where you're going because a room contains two of these hallways. Then when you go back to retrace your steps, you'll forget where you even are. Oh, and you might be looking at this hallway thinking it's the last hallway I showed you in the last scene, but nope, it's actually a completely different hallway. And there's just a lot of that early game jank. As expected, Obtuse Progression is back because it's 1986, and games are just gonna have it. Now granted, I think this game does a lot better job giving hints for progression than, say, Zelda or the last game I talked about, Valkyrie No Boken, 
Like here where you're in this section that's just a simple little walkway, but you see this waiver enemy in an area you can't access, giving you an idea that maybe there's a way to access that area. Or right here where there's lava, however unlike other lava in the game which takes up the entire floor of the section that it's in, this lava sort of exists in a little pool out of place, giving you an idea that it isn't harmful. That's at least something, but I'm sure there's several more parts of the game that are pretty obtuse without clear answers. But as for the other early game jank, it's mostly on a programming side. You can only shoot in three directions, left, right, and up, and you sadly can't crouch which sucks because most enemies are a square big. So just to reach most of the enemies, you need to wait for them to crawl on the wall and give them a blast. Also enemies can respawn way too fast, and when you're walking through doorways, you'll probably be hit with an enemy that manages to walk through as the scene loads, and you might be hit with a game over that's out of your control. I should mention that most of the programming for this game was done by Intelligent Systems. You know them, the Fire Emblem Paper Mario guys, right? Well back in the Famicom's early days, they mainly served as extra programming help, working on a ton of games we've already covered, but of course I was a fool in those early episodes and failed to give them their due. Of course if you're expecting them to be the Fire Emblem guys already, well in these days they were essentially a second party contract developer doing all the technical work while Nintendo R&D 1 handled all the creative work. Of course this fact doesn't make Metroid any better or worse, I kinda hyped up Nintendo R&D 1 in the beginning and had no place to talk about intelligent systems. Whoops. But getting back to the game proper, most of these issues I can be okay with if they fixed one other issue that's my main driving force as to why I'm not so hot on this game. Your life bar. Every time you die in this game, you respawn with a staggering 30 health. The health bar in Metroid is actually pretty unique, I have to say. Holding up to 99 energy points that can be taken away based on how much pain Samus takes, and can be upgraded with an energy tank scattered around Zebus to hold another 99. You can find a lot in this game and make Samus a truly powerful man bot. Well, get a game over and it's down to a single 30 energy. No other tanks are full, a singular 30 energy. And let me tell you, in an area later in the game where enemies can dogpile you within seconds, this decision is just infuriating. And there's no fairy fountain to curve the pain. If you're going to get your energy back, you're going to have to grind for it. No ifs, ands, or buts. And I don't know if this is just me, but it really feels like it's programmed to have enemies drop more missiles than health. So yeah, this grinding thing is exactly the reason I don't hold a lot of positive opinions about this game. If it started me with 99 health, I might be singing a different tune, but alas, it was a stupid decision then, and a stupid decision now. At least your missile count stays the same? Now granted, there are a few power-ups later in the game that do curb this problem just a little bit. Like the Ice Beam. The beam power-up that freezes enemies on impact. It does ultimately slow things down when you're trying to kill an enemy, but for getting a move on, this beam is very appreciated. There's another beam also in the game, the Wave Beam, which lets you shoot through landmass and actually curves itself to hit smaller enemies, which is appreciated, but I think the Ice Beam is more mandatory for reasons I'll get into later. Also mandatory is the Various Suit, which greatly increases your defenses and also makes falling in lava not a big deal. There was nothing more frustrating than trying your best to grind and then getting all your health sapped away because one enemy knocked you into the lava. But with the Various Suit, energy goes down slower than a snail and is such a stress reliever. And finally, the best upgrade in the game. And an upgrade so good it pretty much became the symbol of the Metroid franchise. The Screw Attack, a move where Samus does a somersault in the air and takes out an enemy in seconds. And while this would be great in any other game, in Metroid it's a goddamn stress reliever, because you can use it to grind for health in almost seconds. No more constantly having to shoot enemies and hope they drop health, the Screw Attack takes one hit and they're down. And it actually pretty much replaces your energy cannon now that I think about it.
Metroid is an extremely flawed game in my opinion, but at the same time, I think it's easily one of the most outstanding titles for the Famicom, and for a while there was absolutely nothing like it. The structure of the game being sort of a single area of a world that you can explore and go wherever you think you're ready to is absolutely brilliant, and someone should definitely name a genre after this game. And to say again what I said before, considering that we weren't buried in hop and bop platformers after Mario's success, yet we got something that plays like this, is extra extraordinary. But where I think the game really shines is in its presentation. And not in the sense of this game looks really good, which it does, but more in the sense of tone. What other game went for this creepy space theme, or you know, even horror in general? Granted, I don't think anyone would consider Metroid a horror game, but listening to some of the music in this game just gives off the tone of a chilling space adventure. Again, not a horror game per se, but for a while you could consider this sort of the first survival horror. One man traveling through an unknown space alien base with the possibility that anything could come out of nowhere and kill him instantly as you fight to survive while that more somber music plays in the background. I think it's pretty obvious at this point, but one of the biggest influences on Metroid was of course the 1979 movie Alien and the work of H.R. Geiger, who did the visual design of the movie and his art style consists of very metallic, very detailed man-meets-machine nightmare fuel, which is all over the place in Metroid. And the movie itself being a horror movie based in outer space and on a base where an aggressive alien attacks the crew really bleeds into the gameplay of Metroid, where Samus is all alone in this enemy base and being attacked by hostile aliens. Granted, he is armed pretty nicely to take out these enemies, unlike the crew in Alien, who are essentially target practice for this slasher villain. The Alien franchise has really influenced the Metroid series a lot, so much so that there's a whole list of connections on the Metroid wiki, but one of the major ones has to be one of the bosses in the game, Ridley, who not only looks like a pterodactyl version of a xenomorph, the titular Alien from Alien, but was given the name Ridley after the movie's director, Ridley Scott. Oh yeah, Ridley! That popular character that was so demanded to be in the Super Smash Bros. series? The powerful badass dinosaur pirate alien? How was he in this game? Yeah, a pretty shallow boss fight that slows down the game incredibly. Also there's Kraid, who's more of the same, except he loses points for having me fight his doppelganger. I mean, really, why make me fight too? I guess another positive I have about this game is the password system. Believe it or not, I'm willing to call the Western NES release a more supreme version compared to the Famicom Disk System original, which is where Metroid originally released on, with an actual save system similar to previous released Nintendo games like Zelda and Murasame. But considering how much I think the beginning of this game is a slog, I'd rather have the option of skipping to a later point in the game where I have the screw attack and the various suit. Plus, as fans found out, some of these passwords turn out to be incredibly bizarre and fun to mess around with, but I'll talk about that later. And if I'm being quite honest, there's only one reason I ever come back to the original Metroid, and that's the ending of the game. And with passwords, I can reach it no problem. After defeating Kraid and Ridley, you're given permission to enter the final area of the game, that being a place called Torian, the main headquarters where the Metroids were made to grow and reproduce, and this is when you first see the little guys. And by far, this is the best designed enemy in the game. 
a bulbous jellyfish-like thing with its spiky claws and see-through skin to see the pulsating bumps inside. And through their aggressive behavior, they help build up this section of the game as a survival horror. Because if it attacks you, it sucks your life out and there's not much you can do but bomb it until it detaches from you. Similar yet again to Alien, where one of the first stages of the Xenomorph is the facehugger who attaches itself to your face. And because it's so hard to get off, there is a panic in hopes that you don't end up in the teeth of this monstrosity. A hit with the ice beam and five missiles kill it. And because missiles are activated after pressing the select button, there's that feeling you could mess up this precise order and end up losing a large chunk of life. There's also a bit of art to this part of the game. Calling the game in the series Metroid is actually very commendable in my opinion when most games usually go for the more standard choice of naming the game after a character or giving a game a title that's pretty stock like Dragon Quest. Yet here they choose to name the game after a certain enemy you don't face until the end of the game. Okay sure the Metroids were mentioned in the plot of the game, but even then titling your game after a word that is something you created is still a very artistic thing to do. If video games are art, I think this aspect of the game is truly artful. While the Metroids are the best looking enemy in the game, you'll eventually come across the second best looking enemy, the final boss, the Mother Brain. This pulsating brain creature that rules over the space pirates, but can't seem to do much herself. All she really has is launching spaghettios at you. Yeah, this boss fight could have been better, just don't fall into the lava in front of the Mother Brain or else you'll have a hard time getting out. But let's put this bitch to rest and take her out. Now you have to escape Torian and get out of there before the place blows up by jumping on very tiny platforms that actually take some skill to land on. Wish there's no time and the whole damn place is gonna blow! With the space pirate base finally destroyed, peace may finally be restored to the planets of the Galactic Federation, and maybe Samus will get a nice reward out of it too. Oh wait, maybe invaded by other Metroid? Well, tough luck then, I guess. Hey Samus, you okay there, dude? You're glowing like crap. Oh my god. Samus was a human the entire time? Oh, and also a woman too. I guess that's something. And man, she's got some great features for an 8-bit character. Actually, there may be a chance you don't even get this realization because there's multiple endings depending on how fast you beat the game. The best being some 8-bit fanservice for beating the game in under an hour? An hour? That's actually insane to me. A leotard Samus is second best, which, you know, some people are more into than bikinis. The neutral best of her just taking off the helmet, at least giving you some confirmation she is in fact a lady. And if you didn't do all that great, one where Samus stays in the suit, and one where she turns away from you, disappointed. I'm sorry babe, just give me another chance, I promise I'll do better. Also if you manage to beat the game in under 3 hours, you can replay the game now with a suitless Samus, which is a nice bonus. And that's Metroid, an extremely flawed game today, but alas, was one of the most unique games for its time and deserves its popularity. But you know what would have made Metroid even more popular? How about a sequel? Take what works from this game in around, let's say, 1988 or 1989, put out that in-demand sequel with all around better improvements. Sadly, that NES Metroid sequel never came out, nor was it ever put into development. And over at Nintendo R&D 1, their games began to trickle out even less so after 1986, putting out a single game in both 1987 and 1988. Is this the end of Nintendo R&D 1? Did R&D 4 eventually take over the company completely, leaving the studio for death? Absolutely no. It can make sense why R&D 1's games came out less and less, because the studio itself was working on a super secret project that would have changed the face of gaming forever. They said it wasn't humanly possible. All the power and excitement of Nintendo right in the palm of your hand. Introducing Game Boy. Yep, the Game Boy. During that time, most of R&D1's work was getting the Game Boy created, as well as getting its launch titles and following games ready for purchase in 1989. And from this point on, R&D1 pretty much became Nintendo's handheld branch, working on mostly Game Boy related games, as well as the future Nintendo handhelds. And because they were the studio behind Metroid, meant that Metroid would see a next entry on handheld.
Metroid 2 Return of Samus released five years after the original Metroid in black and white glory. Or black and green, whatever. And with that came a lot of new improvements to the gameplay of Metroid. Samus can now duck to hit those smaller enemies, can shoot missiles and has their morph ball ability right from the start, and can save the game at select spots thanks to a battery backup function now seeing a huge service across many games. Alas, despite a lot of the new improvements, the gameplay of Metroid didn't really seem to complement the Game Boy as the open world exploration function of the original Metroid was made more linear in this title, which can be seen as a disappointment, as the game is about Samus making the entire Metroid species extinct. Also, Samus was way too big for the screen, which, you know, was only so big. Definitely not a bad game, but it's obvious what made the first game so great was its big open world to explore. So maybe, if R&D 1 took the improvements made to Metroid 2, took the world exploring aspect of the first Metroid, but updated it for the next generation of video game consoles, in fact, why not just make it a console game with all the colors and ask intelligent systems to come back and help? You could have a really great game that changes the face of gaming. You all know where I was going with this. Three years later, we got Super Metroid on the Super Nintendo, what many people call the best video game for the Super Nintendo, and maybe even the best video game of all time. I personally don't think it's even the best Metroid game, but damn it, if I said this didn't lay the groundwork for what made the rest of the series so great, then I'd be lying. Everything great from Metroid 1 and 2 are in Super Metroid, but pumped up on steroids, because that's what video games were like back then, the third always being the best. I'm not going to give too much away if you never played it. It's just the first Metroid, but built so much better, and on top of that, having a damn great story that I'm not going to spoil. Actually, one of the best things about Metroid back in the day is that the story between games actually feels complete and not just, bad stuff happens again, go stop it. No, the events of Metroid 1 actually follow into 2, which falls into Super. I don't know if I can say that about many video game sequels, but of course you don't need to play all three in a row to have a great time with Super Metroid. It's just there if you've been following the series since the beginning. And after Super Metroid made a huge splash in the video game world, in the following decade Nintendo made sure that Metroid fans' appetite for new games was fulfilled because the 2000s were pretty much the Metroid decade with not only great games on handhelds, but actually getting an American developer to make a series of Metroid games on consoles. But of course I'll be here forever if I discuss all that, so for now I'll talk about one more game relating to the original Metroid. Metroid Zero Mission. A 2004 Game Boy Advance game that remakes the original Metroid to play a lot more like Super Metroid with a remixed world layout so it's not a one for one copy of the original. It takes everything you love from Metroid and gives it all the staples. Better shooting direction, more fluid jumps, more boss fights, and even shares more information about Samus herself, like actually being born on planet Zebus. So yeah, Samus is going after the scumbags who invaded her home turf. As well as a bonus section added onto the game where Samus is completely removed of her suit and now walks around in her iconic Zero suit. So yeah, if you're gonna play Metroid 1, you're better off playing Metroid Zero Mission, which was actually the final game made at Nintendo R&D 1. In 2003, under the decision of the late great President Satoru Iwata, R&D 1 and R&D 2 were sort of merged into a single company. Nintendo Software Planning and Development. So yes, the two companies that split apart from each other were finally back together again. It was probably for the best, because R&D 2 was not in a great state at this point. After the Satellaview add-on, it switched its focus entirely on game development and was even where the eventual famed Zelda director and producer, Eiji Ananuma, got his start with some interesting original games like Marvelous, Mojito Susu no Takakara Jima, and Sute Hakun, but their eventual fate was making those portable versions of older Mario games for handhelds. So putting them together with Nintendo R&D 1 as video games only got bigger going into the DS era was a great move in my opinion. 
Unfortunately, SPND just turned out to be more or less a supervision studio, with different departments overseeing the production of Nintendo IPs handled by second or third parties. The only real exception to this was the first department, which mostly focused on series like WarioWare, Tomodachi Life, and Rhythm Heaven. Getting back into the original Metroid 1, I honestly don't see much worth coming back to this one. It did its job, and the job is done. Now granted, maybe you'll find an appeal to these super old games. I remember someone I followed on Twitter say they had a hard time getting into the new Metroid games and always fell back to the first title. And hey, with a one hour best ending goal, you could always treat Metroid like a speedrun game, hoping to get ever closer to that bikini ending. But if there's one major reason to even go back to the first Metroid, it is of course with the passwords. Beyond just simply continuing where your game last left off, the password system lets you easily hop into a better section of the game where you have all the major upgrades that makes the game more playable. And thanks to the password generator featured at truepeacein.space, you can edit the password to your liking, and it works. Skip Tutorium with all the upgrades and Mother Brain Dead just to get the best ending, or start the game off with all the energy tanks and missile upgrades and go hunting after all the upgrades starting in Brinstar. The choices are endless. But beyond simple passwords like that, a few folks have managed to come across a few weird passwords that manage to be a string of words. The most famous being the Justin Bailey all caps code where Samus will spawn Suitless and Norfair with an almost complete arsenal. While the origins of who discovered this code is unknown, thanks to an issue of Nintendo Power in 1991, more and more gamers discovered it and its popularity has grown so much that the suit itself has received the fan name, the Justin Bailey suit. Whenever you want to draw Samus, I'll sexy in a pink leotard. Or how about Mother Brain question mark fucking toast in all caps where Samus will spawn Suitless and Torian with Mother Brain already dead. So appropriate title. Pokemon fans will get a kick out of Oddish Tauros Mewtwo Vulpix all caps where Samus will spawn Suitless and Norfair and also one that's just Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Z. May I remind you that Pokemon nor Dragon Ball Z even existed when this game was released. Maybe there's a password relating to are we there yet somewhere in here and people have yet to find it. There's also NARPASS SWORD, oh, oh wait, NAR password. I see. Anyways, this gives complete invincibility. I mean, I can't imagine how many curious fans just typed in some random stuff into the password screen just looking for a result. Alright, how about one more? Engage Ridley, motherfucker. Maybe it'll take me to Ridley's lair with all the upgrades, all the doors shot down. Four energy t- uh, uh, Oh my god, what the hell is this? Yeah, I don't think I'll be fighting Ridley anytime soon. You know, the more I work on this video, the more I have an appreciation for OG Metroid. It's not a game I come back to often, let alone at all. But within the game, there's truly something magical that truly amazed gamers back in the day. It's a solid game. Alright, I think I'm just stuck here. Just bring in the end slate. I'll figure something out eventually. Boing.